Good evening, everyone. It's very good to be with you here this evening. And I'm very grateful to David for the invitation to come and to speak at the launch of this first Learn publication. My own involvement with the project dates back to October 2013, when David invited me to write a short article for a publication on discipleship that he was planning. His hope was that the publication would bridge the gap between the academy and the church, and that it would offer lay people a chance to explore the history, the beliefs, and the practices of the church. I quickly accepted the invitation, but as the project developed, I asked David whether it might be possible to become more involved in the project. And in my brief time with you this evening, I want to share with you some of the reasons underlying that motivation, as well as to reflect a little with you about the implications of those reasons for this project and for the church as a whole. The first reason for my enthusiasm about the LEARN initiative is its dialogical goal. The whole project, from its name, through its ethos, to its activities, evidences a desire to reconnect in conversation. In conversation between our institutions of learning and our institutions of worship, between our central institutions of the church and the congregations in the parishes. That this desire is even necessary would seem highly surprising to some of our predecessors in the faith, whether academics or ministers or both. But it bespeaks the way in which once secure links between our university faculties and between the Church of Scotland itself were allowed to diminish and weaken in recent times. Today, it's very encouraging that there are welcome signs of this relationship being renewed and restored and reinvigorated in diverse ways from both sides. And the point is this. These links between academy and church are important. We are a church which has traditionally valued its learning We've recognized the basic importance of theological inquiry to the health and the coherence of the life and activity of the church. We've acknowledged the great benefit to be had in a ministry which is informed and educated for the challenge which it faces. And we have, at least historically, affirmed strongly the importance of the vocation of the minister to teach to bring insight and understanding by way of sermon, Bible study, and even catechesis, instruction in knowledge of the Christian faith. Catechesis. I wonder how that word struck you when I said it. There seems to be something a little bit unfashionable in some quarters about the idea that discipleship might involve knowledge and learning. Prayer, yes. Action, of course. Sacrifice, necessarily. But knowledge? It seems to me this is part of what the LEARN initiative is about. Recovering that sense of the value and importance of knowledge in the church of today. And recognizing the need to communicate it in a way that is relevant and meets the needs of today's generation. The second reason for my enthusiasm for the LEARN initiative is its target audience. The invitation that I initially received to contribute to the eldership publication indicated that its goal was to provide resources that support congregations to grow and develop in their faith. I mentioned a moment ago the importance of having a ministry which is informed and educated. But it seems to me no less important to have congregations which are informed and educated, especially today. Of course, I don't mean that 
every member of every congregation should be pursuing theological study in a university setting. Although if they did, I know a university in the northeast of Scotland which would welcome inquiries. But the point is this. Congregations should be aware of the cognitive content of their confession of faith. In other words, they should have a good sense of what they believe and by implication, what they do not believe. Here, the ministerial work of sermons, studies, and instruction, that word catechesis again, has a vital role in the welfare of congregations, offering nourishment for the intellectual side of the Christian journey. And on the other side, it's here that the instinctive inquisitiveness of the Christian faith receives its nourishment, helping to fit a congregation for its calling as a royal priesthood. Priesthood? I wonder how that word struck you when I said it. Of course, we all notionally affirm the priesthood of all believers, but how often do we think of congregations as a royal priesthood in the way that Scripture does? In an indirect way, it seems to me that the LEARN initiative can move us along this path of thought with new purpose, encouraging us to think of our congregations as called into a priestly and kingly office and requiring instruction and resource to fulfill that role. These two core motivations of conversation and connection, of congregations and catechesis, can be helpfully considered together in the light of a passage from the first epistle of Peter. Peter writes, in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Now, in this passage, Peter is explicitly addressing all of you, all the readers, or perhaps better, the listeners of this text, men and women, the whole congregation. And the lesson is that those addressed should be prepared to give an answer concerning the reason for the hope that they have. Here, then, is that second motivation about which I spoke a moment ago. The whole congregation called to engage. But if I may paraphrase Paul from Romans for a moment, how shall they give an answer if they have not considered one? How shall they give a reason if they have never thought it through? And so here's the first motivation that I spoke about earlier the connection between theology and church. And in this day of an increasingly diverse and plural society, complexly both religious and secular, at the same time, it seems to me that this connection is becoming ever more important. Increasingly, members of our churches live and work surrounded by people of no faith or of different faith. It's no longer a minority that are in that boat. It's the majority that seem to be in that boat. And against that backdrop, there seems a pressing need for members of our churches to be encouraged, to be empowered, and to be informed, to speak with passion and with wisdom of and about their faith. This need seems to be particularly acute for those in our churches who hold office. And that brings me particularly to the importance of the eldership and to this evening's event. Elders seldom have the benefit of the full theological education that ministers enjoy. I use the word enjoy in the broadest possible sense. There. But elders occupy a no less important position in the governance of the church. And they bring to the task minds no less keen 
and hearts no less willing than their black-robed and dog-collared counterparts. It's to such elders that this first learned publication is directed. It seeks to illuminate, to explain to both existing and prospective elders something of the historical background, theological significance, and practical activity associated with this vocation. It's here that the brief contributions that I wrote for the publication play their small part in the proceedings. In my article on the identity of the Reformed tradition, my aim was to introduce the historical background and theological conviction of churches such as our own in the broad Reformed faith. In my article on the understanding of the Westminster Confession, I sought not only to indicate the history and the theology of our standard of faith, but also to explore the current practical status of the document in our church today. Of course, the task of learning, the task of education, is never straightforward, whether in the university or in the church. It will be no easier in the case of the ongoing education of the eldership with or without this wonderful new resource. There remains a profound apathy to learning in many parts of our church, often manifesting itself in a stubborn, anti-intellectual streak. And beyond even those problems of attitude, there are inevitable resource issues in respect of the manifold and competing demands upon the time and upon the energy of all our people. Yet the words from 1 Peter may once again be instructive to us at this point. Peter counsels us to offer reason for the hope that is in us. Not for our beliefs, not for our actions, although clearly both are relevant and intertwined here, but for our hope. Christians are marked by a particular disposition. And one of the dimensions of that disposition is hope. Not a naive hope, of course, whether for Peter in an age of terrifying Christian martyrdom or for ourselves in an age of alarming church decline. Rather, a certain hope, a sure hope, it seems to me, finally, that as we launch this eldership publication officially today, and with it the LEARN initiative as a whole, this note of hope is a helpful one to hear. Neither this particular volume nor the LEARN initiative in general is a magic bullet, something that will cure the ills of the present day Kirk. But both are a sign of hope, of our hope as a church a sign of faith in the message of the gospel, a sign of love in the desire to explore and to communicate it further, and a sign of trust that God will bless such endeavor to the use and purpose of God's kingdom. After all, it's ultimately the case that our hope is not in ourselves or in any publication. Our hope is in the name of the Lord. Thank you very much.